Thank you all for coming. Um, today I wanted to speak about what I call anti-politics, um, and that speaks on a couple different points. Um, so anti-politics as a strategy, uh, anti-politics as a matter of moral virtue, and anti-politics as a matter of personal hygiene. Um, and I think I can speak a little bit to all of that. So I don't actually regard, um, speaking of the old actually, maybe you may be thrown, but I actually don't believe that politics is an effective strategy for social change. Right? Strategically, I, I just think it's speaking, you're, you're focusing efforts on the wrong people. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, you are, so any kind of political action that, you know, if it's like testifying in subcommittees, or, or, or going to or like going to um, going to court and playing by these rules in their kind of system. Uh, any type of time when you reach out and you touch the political class and you are trying to resolve an issue from like a liberty perspective, um, in, in my opinion, you are, you're doing a disservice, right? So well, it's, it's it's tough to say. There's a service and a disservice. Um, people will, you know, my friend Pedro sometimes argues with me and he says, you know, Mateus, I, I just want drugs to be legalized so people don't get thrown in jail anymore. And to do that, we need to legalize it, we need to do this type of political steps to be taken to pass the executive council and the senate or whatever. And, and it's true, uh, but at the same time, and I want to see them, you know, fewer people in jail as well, but at the same time, by taking that route, I can't help but feel that I'd be legitimizing that route as the natural course for social change. Right, I just came back from a talk with um, uh, I don't remember what his name was, but it was like, you want to save the world, save yourself first type of thing. Uh, Francois. Francois, yeah, yeah. And, and he kind of had this um, perspective, or this kind of, kind of opinion that, that resonated with mine, where it's like, you're just, you're just creating and you're just uh, um, accentuating the kind of public opinion that undermines support from the state, right? By going there and asking for their permission, you're telling everyone around that, this is, this is the right way you should do it, right? And I don't think you should do that. I think that you should ignore the state, and I think that you should work around it, and that you should obfuscate what you're doing, and so forth. Um, but people dump so much money into it, so much time. It's so, it's so sad. Um, all, all the national politics, there's not any hope in, any hope in hell of, 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 of affecting liberty outcomes. Um, but, but even just local even just local politics and local stuff. And maybe there's something to be said for like voting on ballot initiatives where there's like, 150 people voted for this, where one vote conceivably could have made a difference. Um, but from a strategic perspective of let's all rally around behind one great kind of personality cult and they will catapult us into the Oval Office with the gold fringe on the flag and they're going to have all this power to remake the world with their iron, iron grip or whatever. And, you know, in, in the first place, that's what the status wants to do. That's what they're good at. That's what they're capable of doing, that's what they're morally ready to do, right, is to kind of grip the world and change it by violence. And that's just not an amenable way to achieve what we're looking to achieve. I know that he's probably not a popular guy in this room, but Stefan Molyneux had a funny expression um, talking about this, and he says that you can't turn a mafia into a charity. You can't turn the state into a beneficial institution. It's, it's just a corrupt institution. It's just... It's just it is, it is nature, it's, it's, it's criminal, um, the monopoly and the threats of force against competitors. And all, you know, everyone here kind of understands the basic premise of how the state maintains control on the people. Um, and so by, just, by, by taking part in these, in these activities or in these processes, you are sending the wrong message. And I think that people that want to push political routes for liberty as a strategy are looking for these types of get liberty quick schemes. I think that's one of Hess's expressions, right? Yeah. Conkin, I think. Oh, it was a Conkin? Okay. Yeah. yeah, but it's this type of like... Page 16. Type of no. like... <laughs> <laughs> Page 16, paragraph 2, sorry. Verse, verse 3. Verse, verse 3. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I... I think that it's, 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 it's just devoting resources, you know, to an institution that's not capable of delivering the solutions you're looking for. Like, we're looking to remake the conception of how humans should interact. Right? We're looking to we're looking to change people's ideas on how what type of what, what type of interaction is okay and what type isn't. Right? Getting pulled out of my car and getting arrested on suspicion because he smelled through my window, whatever, that is not an acceptable form of human interaction. That's unac that's aggressive, right? That's aggressive as violence. 
you know. Um, and so, you know, I think that just speaking to political actors is speaking to, is like, is like trying to judge motion by a shadow almost. It's a lagging indicator. Politics always changes after society changes. Right. Right? All the major milestones that we've achieved in social and civil rights or, in, you know, um, human rights or, the, you know, democracy, the advent of these things, like, there's always been the social push for women's suffrage. And then there was the political acquiescence. We're like, okay, okay, well, I guess we can't deny these women because I have a race to run in a year and a half, and I, okay, I need to, okay, we're going to get behind this. And, but, but, it's, but, but to speak to that is you're like, it's like the caboose of the train. It's not the engine, it's not the locomotion, right? What you want to do is change the public opinion so that that will fester and boil to change politics. Or if you can change public opinion enough, then politics will just dissolve, I guess. Everyone just quits the club and kind of goes home. It's kind of what I want. Kind of like, what are we doing? So just take my name, I quit, and go home. Kind of, that's the dissolution that I want. And I think there's much more effective routes for, for strategy, for strategic you know, purposes. I think that um, if you attended a talk that I did yesterday, I think that following the kind of crypto-anarchist strategy of undermining the state through tools, through cryptography, through obfuscation, I think it's an underrated way to achieve the society we're looking for. I think education is more effective, perhaps not much more effective. Um, it's all more productive than voting. Yeah, it is, but you're still basically back to the same problem of like, we've got masses of people and somehow we need to corral or lasso them into some kind of kinetic energy for us. And the same problem with politics, for instance, they need to convince millions and millions of people that Gary Johnson's the way to go, or Ron Paul's the way to go, or Rand Paul, or Rand Paul's the way to go. But you know that's difficult. With education, you know it's equally difficult. It's like I I can't convince a million people that the Federal Reserve causes business cycles. I can't even explain business cycles to, to a million people or to a thousand people. Or They're not going to listen. They don't care. So it's the, the educational strategy is very and political strategy. Sometimes they kind of interweave, but it's very difficult. It's a lot of man hours. It takes a lot of beating your head against the wall, against the door. And I think that agorism, crypto anarchy, peaceful parenting, homeschooling, you know, secession, much more viable routes that we can take um, than trying to speak to these idiots with power and maybe they'll lighten up on the pressure on us. I just I don't see that strategy as a strategy. <coughs> but that ties into anti politics as a matter of moral virtue in the sense that because the state is, in essence, a criminal organization, because it, it is not built on any kind of voluntary contractual basis or any kind of social norm that is slowly, you know, uh, um, combining over time and building into this or social structure that's just emerging from thousands of years of harmony or whatever, it's, it's, you know, it's much more analogous to what Mansur Olson described as stationary bandits. Where in prehistoric, in, in, in historic times, or in, in kind of Bronze Age times, times of Jericho or whatever, they would, the, the theory was that there were roaming gangs of basically slavers. Where they were just slave gangs, and they would roam and they'd capture people and they'd kill people, and they'd keep some of the slaves that they captured. And they could only do this profitably once human labor productivity rose higher than bare subsistence. There's no point capturing slaves if they can barely feed themselves. Uh, so, but once human labor productivity rose a little bit higher, it became profitable to capture slaves because then they could produce not just for themselves, but also they could have something to skim off the top. So slavery becomes, um, you know, theft and slavery essentially becomes the world's first labor saving device. Uh, but, you know, the idea is that they kind of roam and capture people and they become stationary. They, they just, they stay with their slaves and they interbreed with them and they become a dominant class over them, right? They don't just plunder them and leave because then there's nothing there next to you. So it's this kind of, there's an idea that comes from, what is it, Nock and Oppenheimer and Mentor Olson and various other theorists that the origin of the state lies in conquest. It doesn't lie in any kind of conceptual contract among people or, or social contract or anything. It's very much an evolution from very brutal conquest and then into assimilation. And now they're assimilated so well, we're all the same, more or less. At, you know, ethnically, we all speak the same language. We, you know, we all, you know, have people that tie in and friends in the ruling class. So the ruling and the rule are kind of very mixed. But there's a very, there's a, there's a difference um, between the environments. And I, I discourage people from participating in politics because I feel like it will do them personally harm. I feel like it will personally corrupt them. 
I feel like the political class, the political environment rewards certain talents, but the talents that it rewards are very different than marketplace talents, like ingenuity and efficiency and innovation and good service or anything like that. It rewards duplicity. It rewards the ability to rationalize why you went over budget and why one of your underlings didn't produce what he expected. It, it encourages and it rewards playing actors off against each other. Politics is a zero-sum game. In order for one political actor to, to win, to gain, to win the election, to win this bill, to get sponsored, whatever, some other opposing faction has to lose. There's, not, there's none of this mutually beneficial political exchange. And in the, in the case that happens, it's because the two parties are agreeing to fuck some third party. When you have when it's like any kind of bipartisan arrangement, when you have like, oh, well, we all agree this will be best for everyone, then you definitely watch your wallet. Uh, but I think that, you know, not only is it think, just, a, just a waste of resources, and we can scale that mountain faster, but the people do themselves damage. You know, I talked to Andre Rosa once um, when he failed to get elected to the, 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 uh, the midterms. He ran as a rep. And he was one of the only ones that I actually wanted to see win. And I wanted to see him win because he's so theatrical. He is so uh, ridiculous. He's, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if you're some, some of you are familiar with Andre, uh, he's, you know, um, flamboyant and, and dramatic and charismatic. And he would just make a fucking mockery out of the whole proceeding. Just when he gets a chance to speak in the public, he would just make a mockery out of it. He would just scream and yell and be like, what are, you, what are we doing arguing over sugar packets? We're sending money to these people to get fucking bombed and we have all these, like, I would want to see that. I would want to see a mockery being made. Because at least it's bringing truth to the institution. Right? The whole thing is a mockery. So if someone's being an actual clown in the in the circus, they're doing they're doing a positive deed. You know, but but everyone wants to go in and change it for the better. Few people want to go into trolls specifically, and that's kind of why I like it. But most people want to go into politics thinking they can grab it kind of by the horns and steer it into this direction, and we're going to be 11 percent more free after I after after I'm done in this regard or whatever. And that is just a, an action that I guess I, I just don't support. Um, I think it's great intentions. I think that the people are really brave in what they're doing, trying to do that. But I think that they're hurting themselves, and I think that they're... It's like carrying the ring. You know, Frodo is charged with carrying the ring, but over the course of his trek to Mordor, it corrupts him. He becomes, he becomes evil, he becomes kind of snappy, he becomes jealous and territorial. It changes him. And so in the same way, I was speaking to Andre about after he uh, failed to get elected, and he told me something very wise. Um, he said, your job changes you. Whatever job you take, it changes you. So be careful what job you take. And it made me think, because some of our other Free State friends, like Amanda Bolden, did get elected, did, did make it into there. And now it, it started making me think, well, how is she going to change? Is she going to be different, a different Amanda than she was when she came in? I mean, on some levels, of course, because time has passed since then, but what, what skills will she have picked up? What habits will she have picked up? What, uh, what, what mannerisms or ways of speaking, of deflecting questions, of deflecting blame? This is just natural skills that accrue to people involved in politics. It's the nature of the institution. And so to survive, you've got to learn the playground rule, I right? have. And, and I just kind of worry, because it's because it is a ruthless organization, there is no beauty in it. There is no humanity, or charity. There is no aesthetic virtue. Um, you know, at, at, at least when people join the military or something, at least they travel and see the world. At least there's some kind of personal benefit to be gained from seeing Eastern Europe or something. But I, it's, I, I feel it is very similar to seeing a house that's being fumigated and you have people that like willingly want to walk right in and I'm the one looking at the side being like, what are you doing? This place is poison. This place is full of, like, it's, killing, it's killing the animals and it's killing the, the bugs or whatever, whatever it does. Um, and I, I, have to, I have to find some better way maybe to express that to get people because it's, a lot of people still want to kind of like lemmings just kind of go off this cliff. Um, but, um, it, it, you know, when people talk to me about should I run, should I do things, you know, I was in discussions with Shem Kellogg for a bit about that, and Shem is hardcore anarchist, 
you know, and, yeah. and he yeah. came from the Ron Paul type of entryway, the whole thing, and we had a long kind of discussion about it. Um, and he's there to he's there to educate people, I guess is the idea. Um, but you know, I, I just worry, you know, if someone had come to me, you know, and said, you know, Mateus, I'm worried about all the racial violence that's happening in the South. And I'm worried about all the public beatings, and I'm worried about, I think, you know, it's my understanding that there's a, a clan resurgence that's happening in this city or this area, whatever. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to infiltrate it. I'm going to try to join it. I'm going to run for, for the grand wisdom, obviously. Because if I win, then I can make it a lot better. I can reduce the amount of violence. That doesn't seem like a viable strategy to me. It doesn't seem like something I would encourage somebody to do. Like, oh yeah, you should definitely become the grand wizard of the clan. You can definitely make an impact in reducing the number of, of blacks that are killed. I think that it would do great harm to the person that succeeded. Um, and I think that they wouldn't get anywhere near the distance that they, that they wanted to. Um, just that the institution, the institution fights it. You know, like, the way that government offices are set up is that to change budgetary matters or to change things that affect other offices, you have to get other people's permission. You have to reach out to other bureaucrats, other departments, and committees have to approve it. And so, just one man by himself as president, as a Ron Paul by himself, could do great, could do great good in what he can control militarily or things like that. But as far as like controlling the whole apparatus, we're going to get a whole government on board and everything. It's just, there's too many un, there's too many unelected bureaucrats that make up the shadow state, right? It's the whole army of unelected bureaucracy that doesn't ever see the light of day from regular people, essentially, is, is kind of the state, um, that would oppose it, that would oppose their livelihood, or oppose their jobs, or oppose their security. Uh, but that ties back into strategy, again. Uh, but the last piece that I wanted to touch on was not getting involved with the state as a matter of hygiene, as a matter of personal hygiene, as a matter of keeping yourself kind of pure and keeping yourself thinking the right thoughts. Now I sound like the objectivist. Yes. But keeping yourself in a manner of thinking that is consistent with what you're looking to achieve and, and the reality around you. So there's a, ta there's a, uh, a concept that I like to bring up or discuss uh, that's called anarchist calisthenics. And I once heard, uh, the first time I heard about that was from James C. Scott um, in his book, The Art of... Not Being Governed. Not Being Governed, yeah, yeah. And it's a great, it's a great idea. So basically, calisthenics is the type of exercise you do. And it's supposed to keep you flexible, and it's supposed to keep you kind of limber, and it's not very heavy cardio or heavy lifting or anything like that. Right? So, but the idea of anarchist calisthenics is for you to practice, for you to train yourself <coughs> mentally to break laws. Petty and minor laws, victimless crime laws, sure. things like that. And the reason for that isn't just to get some kind of existential satisfaction of giving the finger to the, the state or the cops as they drive by, which I know. Um, it's about preparing yourself to make the right distinctions and the right decisions. So I believe, uh, I, didn't, I didn't coin this or anything, but I think it's true. I believe at some point we'll all be asked to, make a, to, to take a stand or to take a choice or make a decision between what's moral and what's legal. I think that time is coming. If some of us have already met that time, that's, that's good or, it, or maybe difficult. I think that time is still coming for a lot of us. And I, I think that we should all start getting in shape about being able to make those decisions. There's a quote by Bastiat, which I really like. He, did, he writes it in the law. He says that um, the easiest way to make the law respect, uh, the easiest way to make people respect the law is to make the law respectable. Right. Uh, but when people l lose respect for the law, when law and morality no longer coincide, then the citizen is faced with a very cruel alternative of either losing his, res his respect for the law or losing his moral sense. And Bastia kind of says that like, it's t it would be tough to choose between one of those alternatives. And because I think that law is, um, I guess, you know, after the establishment of justice and rights and things like that, you know, I have I, I, I weigh more on moral questions than I do legal questions per se. But that was just kind of his manner of speaking in the 19th century. Uh, but I think that the dividing line between what's moral and what's legal is fuzzy, even for a lot of libertarians. You know, I think that there are libertarians that are still almost kind of newborn or still have not really taken the attitude with them. They've taken the theory. 
Maybe they understand the anarchism. Maybe they understand the Bardianism. Maybe they understand um, the Federal Reserve and this and all that. But they haven't taken the attitude that hasn't carried. They're still buried in this type of like, okay, well, let's just file the proper forms and get in line and file a procedure and we're going to change it this way and we're going we're gonna to follow the correct way to do it. Or they still have some kind of bizarre deference for the authority structure, right? Like libertarians, you know, scoffing at people, seeing them smoking a joint outside. You know, that's a habit from a conditioned response of like, oh, these are things that the, these are things that the legal class says are, are, are verboten. You know, these are bad things. So I'm gonna, you know, it's my instinct to just kind of scoff when I see that. You know, my understanding, you know, no, or or, or law breaking or whatever. But I want to encourage people. To, to break those small laws. Now, don't put yourself in real danger. Don't, don't commit crimes and aggression, of course. But, you know, I took up a habit at some point in Manchester. It's risky because there's a lot of cops. But just of going through red lights. Just stopping, looking to see if it was safe, no cars, and then proceeding through. And it's beneficial for me because when I first started doing it, I would just get this, like, palpitation. Just get this, like, somebody could be watching. You know, it's like smoking weed for the outside for the first time. It's like, oh my God, what am I doing? Somebody could be watching. This is terrible. But then eventually, it's like, no, nobody's watching. Nobody cares. Nobody, no, nobody notices the difference except for the person waiting at the red light who's just looking and there's nothing and there's nothing and there's nothing. That I hate that. I, I, I hate, I hate the roads. I hate the robots that control the roads. I hate, I hate everything about that picture. But these are tiny things that we can do to remind ourselves that. Doing illegal things doesn't come with some kind of thunderbolt from Zeus. It doesn't come from some kind of divine response that just turns you into a pillar of salt, like the Old Testament or something like that. Um, you know, maybe and, and, and maybe I'll get caught. Maybe some of some of you will get caught doing things, having a you know a little bit of um, if you have illegal things on you, or if you see or whatever it is that you do. But I'd like to maintain a healthy attitude of scorn and contempt for the people that try to rule me. And the people that try to rule me, it's an institution, so it's kind of vague, it's kind of like, well, these people take orders from these people, but these people get their power from these people. But it's, it's the, the enforcers I personally don't give a whole lot of respect to. The people that are actually the ones applying hands on people to take them places against their will. Um, so there's a whole chain of command that we are living under, which I think is, is, is unfair and it's unjust and so forth, and I don't like to crowd my brain with delusions of these people are serving us or helping us, or the political process is here to represent you, or just call your congressman and just write to your, just write to your alderman, something like that. I don't like to hold on to those ideas in my head, in my head those are delusions. I like to act in ways that undermine that general belief. I think the state ultimately relies on public opinion, doesn't rely on force, because the state is significantly outnumbered when it comes to force. It relies on people believing that it's okay for the, here, here, here are the intellectual rationalizations for why we need these rulers. People are conditioned for decades to believe that way until they grow up in the and well, the rest is history, right? But it's, it's public opinion. Lavoisier, Mises, Hume, many thinkers throughout history have discovered this. That challenging the state successfully doesn't involve a physical challenge, it doesn't, um, it doesn't involve strategic challenge, it, it's, it's, it's ideas, it's ideology. Now in the 21st century, maybe we don't have to have an ideological fight. Maybe it can be a technological fight. Maybe we can technology our way out of this mess. We don't even have to convince anybody, right? That's ideal, I guess. But, I, I just, I, you know, I, I have this perspective, um, and I didn't always have this perspective. You know, I came from very basic cable programming kind of status, just the very basic, you got your channels, you got your beliefs and your tariffs and your whatever. You know, I kind of found, wandered my way through a little snake hole of liberty, and I came here, and I saw the state in very different manifestations. You know, I, I saw it in a kind of David Friedman-esque type of perspective, like, well, these guys are just kind of bumbling and inefficient, and we really shouldn't trust them because they don't have the right incentive structure. Well, we should, let's, let's, let's do without them, let's do it this way. Um, but over time, it became much more radicalized, that they're not just some failing non-profit 
that doesn't do a very good job, uh, but they're actually the root cause of some of the more serious, um, most serious evils, social evils in the world today. And to change the world for the better, I don't think it's valuable to speak to the idiots in power, to try to speak to the ear of the prince. If only we publish another policy report. If only they have it in their hands when they're voting, then it'll be, they'll turn the tide. Um, and I don't, think it's, I don't think it's healthy for people to get involved in that kind of noxious atmosphere, that kind of noxious environment. Maybe there are one-off battles to be gained, and I don't want to deny that there are positives to be gained from successful political action, but it always comes with a cost. And the cost is the cost of your, your legitimacy, right? So bills that prohibit gun, gun, you know, uh, gun bans or gun laws or whatever, that's a victory for freedom in a particular category. Right now, the state can't hassle you for not having a piece of paper about this gun. Right? That's a victory, but at the same time, you've also cemented the idea of this is the route you take. If you've beaten that path with one more set of footprints for the next person to take, and I'd rather people not take that path at all. You know, I think that when people um, continue to advance, I guess, in, in thinking about liberty, or thinking about these ideas, uh, that they will regard the state and regard democracy and regard the government more as I do, as, as someone like H.L. Mencken does, uh, as just kind of a terribly wicked bunch of usurpers and criminals. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I, I love Mencken. I, I really do enjoy H.L. Mencken, um, one of America's best writers, in my opinion. And he wrote this book called uh, Notes on Democracy. I guess it's just chapters of different essays he wrote on democracy. And he has a great expression where he refers to elections as advanced auction sales of stolen goods. Where these people are creating this advanced auction in the future for goods that they haven't stolen yet. Right? We're going to promise you all these goodies, but in order to get the goodies in the future, we have to steal from people either now or in the future. And, you know, uh, democracy is just one slice of, you know, if we lived in a monarchy, if we lived in some kind of other arrangement, I, I propose a different strategy or different ideas or whatever, but with democracy, um, it's such theater. I can't even take it seriously. I can't even pretend that there's any kind of representation or that there's any kind of real progress made towards enlightening me as a citizen. Right? That's on me. I have to improve my life. I, that's, that's on me. And yet, we all people spend so much energy on these opinion mongering contests. Right? Uh, Roy Childs refers to elections. He's speaking to Ayn Rand in, in, in 1969, 71 maybe. 69, 69. It's the open letter. And, and you know, and he says, you know, this is this is crazy that we're spending all this time in these like citywide opinion mongering contests where people will speculate and conjecture and have opinions that aren't verified or backed up and the person can't be reached and it's very they're ambiguous. And this is where the political double speak comes in. And there's no certainty, there's no knowledge. Voting for anyone, you're, you're getting a basket of these policies, but you don't like half of them. You can't, you can't buy a la carte. You can't be like, oh, I like Rand Paul's ideas on this, and I'm going to take that. And I, oh, and I like Dennis Kucinich on how he wants to reform this, so I'm going to, I'm going to take that. And I'm going to take it a little piecemeal, I'm going to build a politician a la carte. You can't do that. You can't do that. It's like, it's like people have already filled out four or five, or if you're unlucky, two shopping carts. Like, all right, which food do you want to buy? Do you want to buy all this different type? Well, this one's got, I don't need pizza. Yeah, that's in there. Oh, I don't need fruit. Well, that's in there, too. You want this one, then? It's just false choice. It's just a, it's kind of, it just reminds me of a comic um, where there's a panel, and there's two people talking. They're like, man, can you believe the people in those countries only have one person to vote for? We have two. Such freedom. <laughs> but I, I think that there's a certain type of um, discipline that... It, it, I think it should be incumbent on people in general, but libertarians in particular, to very strongly want to disassociate from this institution that is the beating heart of what, what they're trying to fight. We're trying to, we're trying to create liberty, right? But we're not trying to create liberty from the mafia warlords or create liberty from the, from the gangs that are over us or create liberty from the bandits that raid us every year. It's liberty from the state. And so it's essentially we're going to the state to petition in some various different manners that they lighten up a little bit on us. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to engage in that, and I don't encourage other people to engage in that. Um, 
you know, it's, for me, what's, what's important, and maybe I am putting too much emphasis, maybe I'm putting too much value on it, and I'll, maybe I'll be, maybe when I'm as, you know, I've been in the game as long as Jack has, and I'll learn the error of my ways, uh, but I think public opinion is so important that it's almost worth more than anything else. It's almost worth more than anything else not to help establish that public opinion, that public legitimacy, that type of perspective in people's mind where they they know that it's wrong to steal, they know that it's wrong to kill and rape and kidnap and beat, but they have this nice exception that they carved out in their thought space for these people that wear these magical costumes and that have the shiny badges, and these people that sit in these you know, palatial halls and write on paper and shout to each other and count the yeas and the nays and all, all of those things have all been an exception from the ethics that we learn in kindergarten. And I want to break that. It's intellectually inconsistent, first of all, from like a Socratic philosophical perspective. Uh, but it's also, you know, what is keeping people enslaved. And I don't have any, you know, delusions that we're going to wake up and, you know, like, like Rousseau says, just like break off our chains all at once and, you know, return to the state of nature or something. But, you know, I want people to be disillusioned. I want people to be cynical about politics. It's frustrating to me when people are optimistic about politics. Because then it's like, to me, it's like, oh, you haven't, oh, you've only looked at the tip of the iceberg. You, you haven't realized all that's required. You haven't looked at all the extra steps. Uh, and, you know, I guess because we're at the Alt Expo, I should remind people once again that we're looking here for alternatives. And so I support almost any alternative that doesn't involve interfacing with agents of the state and playing their legitimizing game, playing their game, getting their petition signed, getting the signatures, getting the, getting, you know, getting on their knees and, and cleaning their feet. Um, anything else but that. Raise your children peacefully, grow your food, you know, enjoy your, enjoy your CBD tinctures, enjoy the agorism, right, build on the black market, build using crypto. Anything else that you want to talk about is um, is excellent and fair game, and I'm for it. Um, I'm not about to start shooting. I may be a little bit different, but there's just a plurality of options that we can take, and I just get I just get frustrated, and I'm sure people here at the Alti Lounge do as well when the tried and true method is always just getting into politics. It's just like it's just like a track that people's brains just kind of like click into. Like, like Hot Wheels cars, you know, there's like, well, clicks and off you go. But it's, you know, it gives people a false sense of accomplishment. You know, there's so much conditioning in our society about this, like, doing your civic duty and playing your role as a citizen, and you need to be sh shaping the social fabric. And the way you do that is through putting your little paper in these boxes. It's, it's, it, gets mad, it gets emphasized, don't, don't worry, don't question the system, don't look behind the curtain. But it's literally the least you can do. I mean that. It's literally the least you can do. Anything else you want to take to change the world is going to be a lot more effort. It's going to be a lot more laborious than voting. But they construct voting in such a way, or voting exists in such a way, that it is quick and easy, and it sates the mental or psychological desire for people to feel that they have done something. People want to have that feeling. They want to feel like they're changing the world, that they've done their part, that they've done their fair share, they've fought in this battle. I'm right here with you, man. We're fighting for freedom. I think it's great that you went out for a couple hours on the streets and you talked to people about food freedom and medical freedom. We're fighting for liberty, man. Can you, I did my part. I went and voted. I put, a, I put a suggestion in a suggestion box. We're fighting on the same team. And, and, I, and I feel like that happens to people, but not, not, not so commonly or straightforward maybe, but that type of thinking overcomes them and they, and they realize like, oh, I've got work and I've got a job and I've got things and I, I want to pursue this food freedom thing, but I don't have time and the bill's coming up in two days, I'll just do that, I'll just go to that. And it kind of saves them, it kind of like fills their belly with the need to feel good about themselves. But I think that's a false food, it's just empty calories. It's just, it's like eating out of wheat. You're not providing any nutrition really to your body, uh, but you're just stopping the rumblings that are making you upset that you haven't done anything. 
And so I think that people taking to streets, people taking to media, you know, if that's Ben Swan or if that's Brett Fanon or you know whatever it is, you know, this could be considered media in some to some extent. What we're doing and filming is so great. Uh, but I think that these types of strategies of real, really interfacing with human beings that are not a part of the hive, a part of the, part of the, you know, the organ of the state, um, that are not public school teachers, or that are not police officers. Or, these people are very difficult to reach. Very difficult to unplug, if I, if I can dare to make a Matrix reference. And there's very, a lot of people who are very unready to be unplugged. And they will fight to defend the system because my uncle is a public administrator of the water of the waterworks of the how I am offended. How dare you say that? Whatever. So you know it's that's and that's another kind of deadly trap of it where people that want to do good they have good intentions um, they just get kind of trapped or into this outlet. And nothing happens, nothing changes. You know, I don't even know if they believe that they're going to affect a change. Just like I don't necessarily believe that when I eat pizza, I'm providing nutrition for my body. But it's the nutrition of pizza, though. It's magical. <sighs> but I eat it anyway because if I don't, I'll be uncomfortable physically. Right? I'll be you know, rumbling and maybe the acid or some kind of thing. I'll be like, oh, I haven't eaten. Two hours. It's the same. It's the same way, and I want to convince people, or persuade them, or, or I guess I want to dissuade people from eating the food of the state. I guess it, it, you know, holding out a big silver platter and a banquet and everything. And you know, to me, that's like it's like it's a trap. I don't know if anybody's read uh, the old um, C.S. Lewis line, "The Witch in the Wardrobe." Uh, but there's a scene, kind of in the beginning, when one of the cousins eats the Turkish delight from the witch, and he just can't help it. He's just fucking crazy for it. Like, he like, gets it all over his face and his hands, and he's like, is there more, is there more? When you bring me your sisters, there's more. Well, so it's just kind of a similar, kind of a similar trap. Um, you, would, you know, you start to end up addicting people to this outlet for change that's really not very productive. Uh, but. As it is, I, I do this, I speak extemporaneously, so I don't have, I don't have a, a spreadsheet or a call plan or a note or anything, so I, I, end up, I end up covering the same ground kind of over and over again, but I think I did a good job, so I'll take this time to finish and open up if anybody has any questions or any opinions. Yeah, I just wanted to give, I guess, a few opinions, but um, uh, they're, all, they're all great and correct ones, so it's okay. Um, but, um, so the first one is when, when you're pointing out people who mock the system, I mean, there's nobody better than Bourbon Supreme. Oh, absolutely. Him. So I think that's one person who I just love that he does the, he does the political stuff and he doesn't really do it, but you know. Um, the second thing was, um, a lot of what you were saying about the anti-politics thing, I know you're not going for it, but it spoke to me sort of as a left libertarian, and like during my talk, I, I had this quote by Kevin Carson that I think you really liked. He says that, the, the aim of the left libertarian is not to overthrow the state, but to ignore it. Anyone who wants to continue to support the state and obey its laws is free to do so, so long as they leave us alone. Our goal is to build the kind of society we want and prevent the state from overthrowing us while we're doing it. The last person out of the state can turn off the lights. Kind of, <laughs> exactly, I love yeah, it. Which is, kind of, which is kind of what you were going for. Also, um, Jack's going to probably quote his Bible, so I'm going to quote Voltaire because that's, that's like my go-to thing. But she has this great essay called Direct Action, which I'd really recommend. Um, it talks a lot about sort of um, powerful sort of civil disobedience and like the just action throughout time that has come without and has inc uh, had a lot of sort of mass chains without, um, uh, without resorting to politics, I guess, in the sense that you're using it. But at one point in the essay, it's a particularly good quote. She says, it is by and because of the direct acts of the forerunners of social change, whether they be of peaceful or warlike nature, that the human conscience, the conscience of the mass, become aroused to the need for change. It would be very stupid, uh, very stupid to say that no good results are ever brought about by political action. Sometimes good things do come about that way. But never until individual rebellion followed by mass rebellion has forced it. Direct action is always the clamor of the initiator through which the great sum of indifference become aware that oppression is getting intolerable. Yep. So. I will say as well that uh, the great enemies of the abolitionists in the 19th century yeah. were not the racist slave owners. Those were those were clear and you know opposite contrasts. But the real enemies were the reformists, were the people who wanted to make slavery humane. 
maybe people who wanted to make laws regulating conduct or make laws regulating how much of a slave could you own and what one's rights and so forth were. And you start to see attempts like that with things like the Three-Fifths Compromise, where they start to give slaves three-fifths of a person's voting right, fucking crazy, um, to offset various you know, social needs where the South politically was you know, underrepresented according to these metrics and so on and so forth. But there's this attempt to make compatible, to compatibilize the institution of slavery with their idea of self-determination and free expression of people and, and culture and things like that. And there was this kind of like ugly, like hack job of like the Three Compromise of trying to like combine these things, but ultimately they're incompatible because slavery is an ultimately unjust institution. So there's no way that you can you can attach or duct tape slavery to a just society or a just institution or whatever you're trying to do and make it and make it work. You just have to abolish slavery, right? There's a there's a quote by um, I think it's, I think it's William Graham Sumner, and he. Um, he explains that. <laughs> that there's there's incrementalism, right? There's incremental gains to be made, but we should always keep the eye on the ideal, right? So his famous expression was that um, pragmatism in theory is perpetuity in practice. Mm. That you don't get anywhere by adopting purely pragmatic perspectives because you don't have the fiery core of hardcore abolitionists that are pushing the narrative. If all the narrative you have is reform, then you're the conservative party. You want to slowly ameliorate this condition, slowly fix it. Yes. There's also a danger if you do it in steps that you take off a lot of the oppression and then a lot of people. It's lightened up enough that a lot of people stop fighting for it. They don't care anymore. Because it's light enough, the low becomes light enough that they go on with their life and quit fighting against it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Now, I'm not advocating political reform at all, but I mean, what about the people like Mark Warden or Shem? That, like, they're straight up anarchists. They're running for state rep in like New Hampshire specifically, and like literally the only thing they do is vote against any new laws that come across. Like. I, I mean, I totally get that, you know, like running for, running as a libertarian candidate for governor in Alabama, that's not going to change shit, but like here it seems like, it, it seems different in New Hampshire, honestly, like I probably wouldn't even vote for him, but like, I'm totally okay with someone being in office and like preventing any new laws from happening. The costs and benefits are different, it's true, I mean, the environment here is so much more palatable to something like liberty, um, that the amount of compromise that someone like Mark Warden or Sean Kellogg would need to do to get along is much less, uh, much lower. Um, also, the, you know, the amount that you know, they're, they're paid, you know, the hundred dollars or whatever, and it's a citizen legislature. All of the little facets that make New Hampshire ideal for what this thing we're trying to do is, you know, it's more successful and I would back more free state New Hampshire candidates than candidates anywhere else in the country yeah. for any other reason. Yeah, it doesn't work anywhere else. But, that said, it doesn't discount, it doesn't deny or cancel out or negate the type of um, moral decay that I think is accompanied by involvement in that apparatus. Um, so It can't be good for your well-being, though. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's, as great as Shem is, and Mark Warden, right, and like Mike Sylvia, for instance, and things like that, I still can't help but feel that they were slowly slowly losing perspective or slowly losing the attitude or slowly losing some part of what made them want to be the kind of firebrand activist that goes into it. It's like by the end of the movie, Frodo is defeated by the ring. You know, he's not any longer in this green, luscious environment of happy and hobbits and the fireworks and the thing. Now he's just like it's like scaling Mordor and it's like cuts and bruises everywhere and it's like black rock and lava, and he's got this, like, fucking machine next to him that it's designed as to suck happiness or to, to be evil, to allow evil or whatever, and it's, like, very heroic, you know? So if there ever is, like, a Frodo Baggins that needs to run for office, like, well, show me him, and maybe we'll support him. We'll get a fellowship for him. But <laughs> I think we are in the Shire. We are in the Shire, right. I, well, man, I went down for, speaking of this, I went down to uh, SFL for the... Yeah, 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 yeah I suppose they... From, from here, from the Shire, so going to D.C., it very much felt like we were going to Mordor. And in the car, we ended up playing some Lord of the Rings music just to set the mood. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. You know, we went...
there to, you know, be missionaries to little orphans and you know, little houses as well. Well, it, it is personally difficult. If you talk to those people, spending a day at the state house, going to those committees and talking to these people, you know, students who want to do this and having to, to try and explain stuff to them, it's very trying on those people. It ties them out. And so, it's on a personal level. They're like hurting themselves. It's exhausting. To, to try to bring a benefit. And it's kind of hard. Is it really worth what, the, for them personally, I don't know that it's worth it, but as a whole, we're all benefiting. So. It, I, mean, I think it's probably worth it to them if, if they choose to allocate their time towards that. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, it's going to have some. It's going to have some like non-beneficial aspects to it. But I, I think if they're willing to run for office, knowing what they're getting themselves into, I mean, I, I think they're. They I think, like, that's the I think they're they happy. Don't know. The new ones don't I know. Think, and no, they do true. leave. Like Mark's not in there anymore. Yeah. It's yeah, it's I, don't, I don't think Mark's rerunning either. Because I mean, it was a lot. Yeah. You, you gave you gave a lot of your life to it. Yeah, he's definitely said things like, you know, I'm never going to get involved in politics again. That was that was horrible, basically. Well, but, you know, I made a reference to like an iceberg kind of analogy before, that people see what it what they think it takes to work in politics, and that's getting elected. Okay, well, in order to get elected, I've got to canvas, and I've got to do research, and I've got to work with these people, we're going to get votes and signs, and we're going to pump up the support, and we're going to beat the incumbent, we're going to get elected. Great. But... That getting elected is like from stage zero to stage one. It doesn't. That's tiny. The goal is not just to get elected. The goal is to fundamentally change or reform the system or abolish objectionable parts of the system. So now it's like, all oh, right, they made the team, they made the cut. Now they're in the playground with the other kids that have been there for years and the powerful ones and the bullies, and they have to learn to get along, to play along, to get along, and they have to shelve these <coughs> utopian ideas they had because, right. you know, this is already happening with, um, I don't want to speak badly about anybody, I just want to talk about facts, I guess, but I think it was Elizabeth Edwards, uh, Liz Edwards, mm -hmm. who had some kind of controversial position on like the gun ban, because she didn't want to tell the Democrats that she was a free stater, so she signed on to the, one of the bills that banned guns or whatever. So it's like, that is, that is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, that is, that is immediately the incentive structure that you face when you enter that institution. Because there's people that are already populating that institution, that already have their own designs, that already have their formulations and what they want to see and the plans that they're going to implement to do that. And here's a new wave of freshmen, new midterm elections coming in, here's a new freshmen coming in. And they have to fit, they have to get, they have to assimilate into this hostile, very really high school type of environment, a very peer pressure environment. I'm sure there's pressure too from like the small government, I don't even want to say libertarians, like the small government, the or yeah, the minarchists basically. They, you know, they're free state project movers, but they're like they're totally whispering in the ears of the anarchists that run like, yeah, I know you're an anarchist man, but you know, we need like a little bit of oppression. <laughs> yeah, what the? That's a slightly unfair. unfair. I'm pretty sure no, no minarchist has ever whispered that in anyone's ears. I'm pretty sure they've never whispered that. It's a little uncharitable. It's more along the lines of we need a foundation of yeah. law. Yeah, I mean, something like that. Yeah, yeah. The word oppression there is an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. Like, we need a little government because people are bad and stuff. Yeah. Or we can make a difference. I don't want to. We got to vote in self defense to keep them from passing something bad. Right? Um, oh, yeah, we got like five minutes. Okay. I don't want to get this into like a sanctimonious type of thing, like a I'm more anarchist than thou type of battle or contest. Right. Or yeah. It just seems to me, Absolutely. to be my experience, that when you understand, like cognitively, like theoretically, like intellectually, that the state is a criminal class and they operate by these means of extortion and kidnapping, they operate by these mechanisms, and you realize that the people that run that violent institution are themselves not intelligent or not charitable or not giving or not good, compassionate people. They are less so in New Hampshire, but in everywhere else, all types of legal predators, essentially. They're lawyers or they're various people that have been involved in legal apparatus since they were, they were born and raised, and all the money it takes and everything. To be. They are not good people. Right, right. These are members of the Mafia. These are family, these are heads of families of the Mafia that are in charge of this system. And once you start to put that together, you start to realize, like, hey, this society can work without them. They're bad people. In my experience, it leads to an understanding of 
Okay, well then, let's just fuck that. Okay, we're do this, we're, we'll do this ourselves. Don't get me involved. I don't want to deal with it, whether it's parking violations, whether it's, you know, carrying around, um, you know, illicit substances, federal contraband, right? or whether it's involving in any kind of particular infraction the state decides to give you for this kind of tiny thing. You know, uh, there's responses that you can take, but the response that I do not encourage is playing along and, you know, taking part in voluntarily, happily, willingly into that system. You know, when I'm in the airports and I'm in doing the TSA, I, I never assume the surrender position. You know, I choose to opt out. I choose to make them take the time of the day out to service me. I choose to speak to them about it. I choose to interact with them and hopefully I'll reach them. Right? There's a path of least resistance operating within all the state type of stuff, and I just issue that. Too. I don't need to take the path of least resistance. I don't need to. I don't need to. You know, I get I get a ticket or whatever, and I pay it instantly. Well, maybe not. Maybe I'll write them a letter. Maybe I'll call them. Maybe we'll fight it. Maybe something else can happen. Um, and so, I, you know, again, I, I said earlier I didn't want this to be like a well, they're not anarchists, they're not for something, but it just, they, they said the attitude tends to fall in line with the realization, which tends to fall in line with the theory of, of the state. So if I notice that there are people that are anarchists and they recognize that it's just a fucking barrel of monkeys in there and it's just not conducive to anything valuable, but they still have this kind of deferential attitude or they still have this kind of like ingrained conditioned response to their handlers yeah. that they should do this. I just like to speak to them. Yeah. That's something that I run into myself. I recognize it, but the problem is is that not only it, um, or do you live with it your whole life no, thinking that it's it's real, but the thing is is that the cops are real people and the guns that they point at you are are absolutely real. So the threats are very real. So the question you yeah that I, that I have is, yes, I understand that, but, I mean, in the sense of self-preservation, isn't it a, a good thing to be deferential in certain, to a certain degree? To a certain degree, when you, you know, when prudence dictates, right. but the more that I become radicalized, the more libertarian that I, that I live in this environment and I breathe and this shit, whatever, right. the more risks I'm willing to take kind of marginally, you know, like, that's a that's a good point. Even little tiny things. Yeah. Are, are it is fun for me. Like I got pulled over once, got a ticket. Well, um, and, you know, and I remember the cop asked me to take take the window down, whatever, and he rolled it down like yeah. three inches. Yeah. You know, and he looks and says, "What? You can take it down further?" And I looked at him and said, "This is fine." I can, but what? I don't what? want this to. I don't. I don't roll my window down all the way to strangers. What do you mean? You should, what do you mean? It's fine. You should have. You should have said sorry. I'll get my megaphone. Give me a second. Yeah, I'll well, let me put out. The well, let me to get my megaphone for you. Okay, does this work? Does this work now? <laughs> I don't like the smell of the gun. Well, no. So you have to be differential at a certain point. If they're surrounding your vehicle with guns drawn, I recommend nothing but. Hands on the wheel, very slow yeah, movements, yeah. hands out the window, yeah. getting over, taking yeah. off the pants and grabbing your ankles. <laughs> yes. That's what I recommended. I feel like, yo, he went for my gun and they'll blow your brains out in the heart. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. If, if, well, yeah. Like you did in California. I don't know if it will happen, but it can right. happen. And I don't want to. So I think we got to wrap up. So. All right. Well, I appreciate all of you joining me here. Um, this, was, this has been a great talk. I appreciate your comments and questions and opinions. I hope I was able to motivate some alter some ideas of alternative strategies or ways that we can work around the state right. rather than trying to funnel everything through it. Um, but that is it for me. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>